Good morning. I convene this hearing of the Subcommittee on Oversight and Investigations to examine the Department of Health and Human Services management of the Affordable Care Act as we approach the January 1, 2014 deadline for full implementation. Mr. Gary Cohen, Deputy Administrator and Director of the Center for Consumer Information and Insurance Oversight, or CCIIO, otherwise known as SOSIO, is here to testify on behalf of HHS. Good morning. SOSIO was responsible for implementing the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act's many changes to the private health insurance market. Mr. Cohen and those at SOSIO certainly have their work cut out for them. At the beginning of the next year, full implementation of PPAC will finally take place, and on that day, Americans have been promised the ability to purchase health insurance plans through new exchanges. The American people have been promised good coverage that is also affordable. We all remember the many promises that were made in the rush to pass the, the bill by any means necessary that if you liked your coverage, you could keep it. Yet we see many stories about impending doctor shortages and companies faced with tough decisions on whether to continue providing coverage. The decision on whether to provide that coverage is related to another promise that will surely be broken, that the law will lower costs. One large health insurance company CEO has already noted that Americans should get ready for premium rate shock. A school district in my district has said that they're going to see their premiums go up by something like a million dollars in cost. Yet there is yet another promise that we are hearing more recently from the law's defenders that the health insurance exchange will be ready for enrollment on October 1 and full imp implementation on January 1. Since only 18 states elected to establish their own exchanges, SOSIO is currently preparing the federally facilitated exchanges that will cover 26 additional states, along with the partnership exchanges SOSIO will operate with seven other states. I hope we will be able to hear today about the progress being made in building those exchanges. Recent news reports have indicated, and even President Obama's budget has confirmed, that the administration is seeking additional funding to operate the exchanges. This is troubling considering that a substantial amount of funding has already been expended building those exchanges and they have yet to even begin. Today I expect the witnesses to provide a full accounting of where SOSIO stands with regard to building the federally operated exchanges and those that will be run in partnership with states, including where SOSIO is obtaining funding for these programs and will they ask for more. Since passage of PPACA, this committee has had many questions about the funding being used to implement the law. Most recently, we have heard many stories about the health care laws prevention and public health fund. Most notably, that money from this fund is being utilized to hire thousands of health care navigators who will assist the public in signing up for Obamacare. Considering that we have also heard that funding from the prevention fund is being used on many different projects, we're concerned that it is being rated as an ever-ready piggy bank or slush fund to throw money at and hide the many problems inherent with implementing Obamacare. I hope that Mr. Cohen will be able to address the potential overutilization that has become so common that the Washington Post has dubbed it, quote, the incredible shrinking prevention fund, unquote. We have many concerns about those navigators, including how they will be trained and supervised. SOSIO is actively soliciting navigators from the community and consumer groups, yet those that receive any compensation from insurance companies are prohibited from becoming navigators. We recognize the need to have impartial navigators, but the realities of the insurance market also indicates that those who have been selling insurance for many years may have some expertise of value. Furthermore, we have questions about in what standards will be put into place to ensure that we are not simply paying groups chosen to be navigators to pad their membership roles or funding drives. In other words, someone with experience and training is not qualified and is excluded, whereas someone without any experience has, stands in front of the line for hiring. But this only scratches the surface of many activities and responsibilities of SOSIO. Today, I hope we will also be able to discuss SOSIO's ability to determine whether health insurance premiums increase are legitimate. As I mentioned before, one large health insurance company has already warned of rate shock, and this is an obvious concern for many Americans. Obamacare uh, have consistently promised lower costs, and now we all hear from supporters of the law that there are tax credits and subsidies available, but a recent study showed that only 8 percent of the public will qualify for those subsidies. I hope we can hear from the witnesses today what the other 92 percent of us can expect. Thank you again, Mr. Cohen, for joining us today. And now I'd like to recognize the ranking member, Ms. Gett, for opening statement. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and welcome to you, Mr. Cohen. Thanks to the Affordable Care Act, tens of millions of Americans who would otherwise be uninsured will receive health insurance for the first time. Americans will enjoy protections from the worst abuses of the insurance industry. 
rescissions, coverage denials, and annual and lifetime limits that cruelly cut off coverage for folks when it's needed most. These are all big changes, and the time to implement them is coming up very, very fast. In just over five months, citizens will be able to sign up for health insurance through the federal or state marketplaces. Now, while signing up for coverage should be easy come October, implementation is going to be a complicated process over these next few months, not because of any flaws in the law, but because this is a new approach to providing coverage nationwide, and these things are always difficult to implement. And by the way, the CBO has predicted that overall consumer costs will go down once these marketplaces are implemented. There's no reason to think it won't work. It worked great in Massachusetts under Mitt Romney. But we have to educate millions of people about the marketplaces in advance. Sosio and the states have set up complex data systems to manage the process. So, Mr. Chairman, I'm super glad that you're doing this oversight. And I think we need to hear from Mr. Cohen, probably not just today, but as we go through the summer, about how Sosio is doing, where there are challenges, and how the agency expects to address those challenges. I do think, though, that we should conduct this oversight with an appropriate perspective. I wish, for example, that when the naysayers raise the specter of a potential increase in premiums for some young, healthy people, particularly young men, that they could also put this into perspective by understanding that the tax credits and caps on out-of-pocket costs will sharply lower overall costs for these individuals and millions of other Americans. And I wish that folks raising the specter of high premiums for young men in particular could add to that perspective the millions of women of all ages who will pay lower premiums and who won't be discriminated against insurers by, simply because they're female, or the millions of Americans who will receive dramatically better and more dependable insurance coverage. When people complain about the fact that the Obama administration is, heaven forbid, spending money to make sure that citizens understand the new law, I wish they would take the perspective to remember that the Bush administration did the same thing, even hiring blimps to spread the word about Medicare and spending $300 million on a public relations campaign for Medicare Part D. And, Mr. Chairman, I will say I voted against the um, Medicare Part D bill because it didn't allow negotiation by the Secretary of HHS to lower prescription drug class costs. But even though I voted against it, I had, I had town hall meetings all throughout my district, and I, I had Internet training to help my constituents figure out how to sign up for it. And I think we need to have that kind of bipartisan cooperation as we implement these exchanges the national and st at the national and state level. And so I hope that we take that appropriate perspective, and I hope that we can develop that perspective as the Affordable Care Act is implemented over the coming months. In t January 2006, when we implemented the Medicare Part D program, Time Magazine described the, quote, initial nightmares of implementation, noting snafus that have re resulted in many low-income seniors being turned away by the compounding new prescription drug program. In Vermont, the implementation of the law was described as a, quote, public health emergency. Now, those problems are almost forgotten until today. Ultimately, the Part D program got off the ground, and even those who initially voted against the bill, like me, took a stake in it and worked to fix the problems. The biggest problem, the donut hole, was eliminated by the Affordable Care Act. So I think, Mr. Chairman, as usual, there's a lesson to be learned in this history. I hope that the implementation of the Affordable Care Act goes smoothly. I certainly hope it goes more smoothly than the implementation of the Medicare Part D. But I'm not in naive enough, and no one should be, to think it will be completely wrinkle-free. What I do hope is as problems arise, we can work together to identify and fix them instead of using them to simply score political points, because we all have a stake in providing quality, affordable health insurance coverage for all Americans. I hope this hearing and our future work on this subject represents an effort by everybody to truly work together to implement this law. I thank you for having the hearing, and I yield back. Generally yields back. I now recognize the chairman of the full committee for five minutes, Mr. Upland of Michigan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman.
Today's hearing continues this committee's rigorous oversight of the Obama administration's implementation of the health care law. Since the law's passage, we have had SASIO before this subcommittee three times. And during previous hearings, we uncovered that the promises made about the Affordable Care Act didn't quite match up with reality. 2011, we learned that SASIO was granting waivers from the law to individuals and companies that would face large premium increases or the loss of coverage because of Obamacare. We also found that uh, through the, its implementation of the Early Retiree Reinsurance Plan, SASIO had, had handed out millions of dollars to certain corporations, unions, and state governments. Even more troubling was the fact that the Early Retiree Plan burned through the $5 billion allocated to it so quickly that it had actually stopped accepting applications in May of 2011, more than two years before the program was supposed to end. Yet this is the same amount of money that was given to the pre-existing condition insurance plan. This bill has been the law of the land now for some three years, and we are just eight months away from the full implementation, and by all accounts, the administration still doesn't have its act together. Doesn't bode well when just last week a top supporter of the president, leading Senate architect of the law, publicly warned the HHS secretary that he sees a train wreck coming. Will the exchanges be ready? How will families be able to prepare for it? Will they be able to rely on the promises that if you like your coverage, you can keep it? Will young adults be able to afford higher costs? The alarm bells over how Obamacare will unfold are getting louder by the day. Costs are going up. Insurers are warning about premium increases. And small businesses are indeed struggling with the choices about whether they can provide employees with coverage. Patients need certainty. Employers need certainty. And I hope that HHS and SASIO will always show us what they are doing to implement the law by the deadline. Finally, last week, this committee marked up a bill that targets the Prevention and Public Health Fund to give that money to those who need it most, Americans with pre-existing conditions who were promised coverage by supporters of Obamacare only to find that the program was closed to new applicants a few weeks ago. The pre-existing condition insurance plan has been an unfortunate example of the problems of Obamacare. The promises don't match reality, and I think that it's unacceptable that this is going to happen and look forward to the vote this afternoon to fix it. I yield the balance of my time to Dr. Burgess. I thank the gentleman for yielding, Mr. Cohen. Thank you for coming back to our humble little subcommittee. Um, of course, my interest in SOSIO actually predated SOSIO when you were OSIO, right after the Affordable Care Act passed. And Mr. Angoff was good enough. I didn't get a hearing on that. We were in the minority, but Mr. Angoff was good enough to come to my office and talk to me at least. Uh, Mr. Larson has been in a couple of times, and you've been before us uh, at least one time before. But I've got to tell you, it's been very, very difficult to get information out of the Center for Consumer Information Insurance Oversight, the basic budgetary information. Now, the ranking member says that we all ought to be in a posture of working together. It's difficult to do that when the most basic questions are, remain unanswered. So we've got October 1st. It's coming fast, five months away. And it seems like there's more and more questions about the readiness of your office and indeed the administration uh, to get the answers that people want. I mean, you yourself went to the insurance, uh, AHIP, the American Health Insurance Plans Conference this month and quote, it's only prudent to not assume everything is gonna work perfectly on day one, close quote. I agree with that. But I think we at this committee need to hear from you uh, where are the concerns? Where do you see the lights blinking on the dashboard? What are you doing to prepare yourself and your agency and your center for that day in October that dawns and everyone goes online on the federal hub that may or may not exist to be able to sign up for these programs? Uh, Senator Rockefeller actually said it pretty well the other day. Uh, people are going to get a bad impression and it's going to stay with them. Um, I think the references to Part D are, are reasonable to make, but remember that day happened after two years of preparation. You've had three years of preparation. The six weeks of turmoil with Part D could likely turn into many more weeks and or months or even years of turmoil when, uh, when this program is, is unfolded next year. So the application process is lengthy and complex. People are asked to estimate whether or not they think their employer will provide insurance next year, what their earnings are going to be next year. I mean, these are tough questions that 
need answers, and we hope we get some today. And certainly we'll be uh, adding additional questions in writing in the, the period that, uh, that they're allowed. So I thank you for being here today and look forward to your answering questions. Gentlemen's time has expired. Now recognize the, the uh, ranking member of the full committee, Mr. Waxman, for five minutes. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. The um, Republicans on this committee and our health subcommittee have held five hearings since December on the Affordable Care Act. And each of these five hearings repeats the themes that they expressed when they opposed the bill. And they certainly never expected this to become law. Republican members can't accept that health reform is working, and it is now the law of the land. They opposed it from the beginning, and until the day the President signed the bill into law, they insisted it had no chance of passing. Until the Supreme Court ruled it constitutional, Republicans said, oh, it's not constitutional. Until the day President Obama was reelected, they insisted the American people would vote him out of office so they could overturn this law. None of that happened. And now they call this an oversight hearing because they predict all these terrible things to happen. They're not predicting, they're wishing bad things to happen. This is not a hearing to be constructive. It's a hearing to attack the law and hope that it doesn't work. Well, the Affordable Care Act will go fully into effect, and Americans will never again have to worry about their ability to get affordable, high-quality health insurance. So the Republicans are saying, well, the implementation is not going to go smoothly. Well, implementation of any new big program has its kinks, but the Affordable Care Act is proceeding on schedule and it's done a remarkable amount of good for people. Over three million young adults now, now have health insurance. Over 100 million Americans have received pre-preventive pre health benefits. More than six million seniors have saved $6.1 billion in the Medicare D, Part D drug program. And beginning next year, tens of millions of Americans who would otherwise be without health coverage will have dependable quality health insurance. My Republican colleagues said people want certainty. Well, the certainty they would have if there was no Affordable Care Act is that millions of people would be discriminated against because they have pre-existing health conditions, because they offer a risk to the insurance companies to have to pay more money for their care. They'd have the certainty of knowing that insurance companies would do everything they could to keep them from getting coverage if it's going to cost the insurance companies money. And that's what we wanted to change. Republicans still oppose the Affordable Care Act. Uh, they are not taking a constructive approach. They're not saying, what can we do to make this law and its implementation work more smoothly? They're saying, what can we blame people who supported this law uh, about uh, problems that may came up, come up? Well, I'm pleased that we have at this hearing today, again, Gary Cohen, who was here in December answering many of the same questions. I'm sure he'll be addressed today. The Center for Consumer Information and Insurance Oversight has made huge progress in implementing the Affordable Care Act. Success doesn't change the opinions of my colleagues on the Republican side of the aisle. It makes them even more determined to look for something they can criticize. And today on the House floor, we're going to vote on a bill that they've produced because the, the, under the Affordable Care Act, we had a high-risk pool for people with pre-existing conditions who are waiting until January to be able to buy health insurance without being discriminated against, without being charged more money because of those pre-existing conditions. We have spent uh, $5 billion on a program to proceed that to help people with pre-existing conditions to be in a high-risk pool. And we ran out of money. Republicans don't mind that we run out of money for everything in this, that the government does because they supported the idea of sequestration happening. And we're running out of money in all sorts of places. 
where the government has an obligation, but we've run out of money for that pre-existing pool, pre-existing uh, medical problems pool, until the last few months of this year. So the Republicans, suddenly concerned about people with pre-existing conditions, decided to make sure that fund has enough money to go on for the rest of this year. But they funded by taking away the public health prevention funds until 2016. Makes no sense whatsoever. We're happy to support the continuation of that pre-existing pool to the end of this year, but certainly we could have found a better funding source and the Republicans have denied the opportunity for any other source to be offered on the House floor today. You have to question how sincere they are about wanting to help people with pre-existing conditions, how sincere they are wanting to see a smooth implementation of the bill in, uh, now that it is law. They want this bill to fail. They want to go back to the time when millions of people had no chance for insurance. That's the certainty they want to offer, and it's the certainty that led us to have the Affordable Care Act passed into law. I congratulate Mr. Cohn and his agency for doing all that they're doing. It's an important service to make sure the law succeeds, and that's what we should all want to see happen now that it is the law, and they lost the last election and their last chance to repeal it. Gentleman yields back. Uh, all right. Um, for our witness, Mr. Cohen, uh, you are aware that this committee is holding an investigative hearing and when doing so has the practice of taking testimony under oath. Do you have any objections to testifying under oath? No, sir. Uh, the chair then advises you that under the rules of the House and the rules of the committee, you are entitled to be advised by counsel. Do you desire to be advised by counsel during your testimony today? No, sir. In that case, if you would please rise and raise your right hand, I'll swear you in. Do you swear that the testimony you're about to give is the truth? The whole truth and nothing but the truth. Thank you. Thank you. We are now under oath and subject to the penalties set forth in Title 18, Section 1001 of the United States Code. You may now give a five-minute summary of your written statement. Mr. Cohen. Thank you, and good morning, Chairman Murphy, Ranking Member to get members of the committee. I appreciate the opportunity to tell you about Sasayo's accomplishments over the past year. A lot has happened since your last hearing on implementation of the Affordable Care Act, and I'd like to describe for you some of the progress we've made and explain how I know that we are on track for open enrollment this October. We achieved a major milestone earlier this month when we opened the window for issuers to begin submitting plans to be sold through the federally facilitated marketplace. We said that would happen on April 1, and it did, right on schedule. We've had a very encouraging response, and we expect to see robust competition for the business of millions of Americans who will be shopping for health insurance in this new marketplace. States that are operating their own marketplaces have begun ac accepting submissions from issuers as well. It's also important to understand the ways in which we've continued to improve our process since the window opened on April 1. We've gotten feedback from states and issuers as they've accessed the system, and we've addressed whatever issues have come up. We have a help desk that responds by email to anyone with questions about how to submit information to us. We hold regular phone calls, and we regularly publish answers to frequently asked questions. At last count, there were over 200 answers to frequently asked questions in connection with this process that have been provided to uh, issuers and states. I'm extremely proud of the work that the team is doing to make sure that we will have products on the shelves by October 1st. Another key element of this process is the federal data hub. As you know, consumers will be providing certain information in order to determine whether they are eligible for tax credits to help pay their premiums for the commercial health insurance that will be offered in the marketplaces. This data will be transmitted to the data hub in real time to be checked against information that is available regarding income, citizenship, incarceration, and so forth. The hub will not store any individual's data. It is a conduit from the agencies where this data is kept, such as the IRS, Social Security, and Department of Homeland Security. This will enable real-time electronic verification of information needed to determine eligibility and will reduce to the greatest extent possible the need for people to submit paper documentation. States that are operating their own marketplaces will also have access to the data hub. We've recently begun testing the connection between state systems and the hub and have succeeded in transferring data back and forth. This is another major milestone that has been achieved on schedule. 
Testing will continue and the hub will be fully operational in time for open enrollment this fall. Another key element is the single streamlined application that consumers will use in order to find out whether they are eligible for Medicaid or CHIP on the one hand or tax credits to purchase commercial insurance plans through the marketplace on the other. We've gone through ex an extensive consumer testing process since the draft of the application was published and we've continued to work to make it as simple as possible. The results have been encouraging. Highlighted messaging will help answer questions, alleviate concerns, and direct consumers to where they can get additional help. We found that most applicants will need to complete less than one-third of the total number of items included in the entire physical form. Now, no matter how simple and straightforward we are able to make the application process, we know that buying health insurance is not like buying a book on Amazon or shoes from Zappos. Many of the people coming to the marketplace will never have had commercial health insurance before and will need help in choosing the plan that's right for them and their family. During the past year, we've been putting in place a variety of ways for people to get that help. On healthcare.gov, people can learn about the Affordable Care Act, review health insurance basics in order to understand what their coverage costs, and interact with a checklist on how to prepare for shopping for coverage in the new marketplace. There are several short videos explaining how shopping for qualified health plans in the federally facilitated marketplace will work. In addition, healthcare.gov will have a chat capability so that people can get their questions answered quickly as they use the site. The call center will begin operating in June, and during open enrollment, it will be answering questions 24 hours a day, seven days a week. On April 9th, we announced a funding opportunity for recipients to operate as navigators for the federally facilitated and partnership marketplaces. Navigators will provide fair, accurate, and impartial information to help consumers use the marketplace and select a qualified health plan. Meanwhile, licensed agents and brokers, compensated by the issuer and regulated under state law, may enroll consumers in coverage through the marketplace in every state. As you can see, CMS has been hard at work over the past year improving the health insurance market for all Americans. This work and these achievements make me confident and excited for the future health insurance market. Soon, consumers will have better access to health coverage that best fits their needs. So I thank you for holding this hearing, and I'd be happy to answer your questions. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Cohen. Let me um, recognize myself for five minutes here. Uh, regarding the navigators, uh, the, I believe the law says that if they have received compensation from an insurance company, they are not eligible to be employed as a navigator. Is that correct? That's what we've said in our regulations. If they receive compensation from an insurance company in connection with enrolling people in health coverage, they are not eligible to be navigated. So let's say Mary Smith is an insurance agent in Pennsylvania, 20 years in the field. Now, she received a license to sell insurance from the state of Pennsylvania. In order to do that, she had to have 24 credit hours of training. Then she takes a test. She passed the test, must continue to take 24 credit hours of training every two years to maintain her license. Let's say she has sold a wide range of insurance from multiple companies, for-profit and not-profits, to perhaps thousands of individuals. She would like to apply for jobs as a navigator. There's also John Doe, who's applying for jobs as a navigator with a high school degree and zero experience selling insurance. Who's eligible to be hired? So I think it's important to understand that there really is a difference between what a navigator does and what an insurance agent does. I understand, Smith, but I just Mary want to make Smith, sure you understand. Mary Smith is not qualified? Mary Smith is qualified to offer insurance in the marketplace as but not, an agent. not as a navigator. She's, she's not eligible for a navigator. She's discriminated ranking. for being a navigator because she has experience in the field that's paid. Am I correct? But she's welcome to help clients obtain coverage in the marketplace I understand, but as an agent. But, but someone who has actually done this for a living is prohibited from being hired to advise people to buy insurance uh, under uh, the uh, exchange, or to be advised on how to buy insurance in the exchange. Am I well, correct? She could, she could choose no longer to be selling insurance but on behalf she, of issuers and be a navigator. That's her choice. So if she has had, uh, as long as she's no longer taking any money from insurance companies. Right. She's eligible, correct. Now let me ask you this, because something that's still uh, I'm puzzled about, in, in terms of the time frame here, because a lot of employers are saying to me, I've got to make decisions now. They're not going to start budgeting, you know, having budget decisions on December 31st, but want to make decisions now. How soon will the information be available to them in terms of what is going to be in these exchanges? Do you have some date of that? Yes. The, the uh, uh, plans are being submitted now. They'll be reviewed both by us and by the state insurance regulators that have to approve the plans. Uh, the, and then um, issuers will have an opportunity to make any changes. Just give a date in terms of when those will be available. September. In September. Now, the navigators are going to have complete final training in August, so that seems a bit odd, according to your calendar. They can't really get final training before they 
see the exchanges. So I hope you would adjust that date. Well, the, the primary function of navigators in the early period will be outreach and enrollment, and then once open enrollment starts in October, then that's when they'll be helping people. So these things will be available for look in September, but then sales of these plans will start in October, a month later. Correct, for coverage you, in January. And you feel you'll be ready with everybody fully trained and people fully informed on what's available in that month? Yes. All right. Now, I want to ask you also another thing with regard to um, navigators, because there's some concerns I've heard that people who are, are people who are involved in some community groups or political groups, they, they can apply for uh, jobs as navigators? So the requirements for uh, applying for a grant are set forth in the funding opportunity announcement. I mean, I'm just wondering if there's prohibitions in terms of involvement in other activities that they would not be. We are hoping that groups that have a demonstrated uh, history of serving their community and serving the people in their community uh, that we're trying to reach will apply for so navigator grants. ACORN members could? I can't speak to any particular well, they're, group. They're, they but they wouldn't prohibit them, right? They can apply, okay. and they'll, their application will be reviewed, and we'll be making decisions. Well, given that they're community groups, <clears throat> I'm concerned about data confidentiality and HIPAA laws, et cetera, certainly if they're discussing their own health with uh, navigators. What assurances will you have in place, and what penalties will there be to make sure they do not keep that data? <clears throat> it's only, for example, on government computer systems. They cannot use it for any other purpose. Could you address that issue? Certainly, thank you. So navigators will be trained on the importance of privacy and security and will be subject to all of the laws and regulations that uh, protect uh, uh, people. Are there other specific data. criminal penalties if they use this data for there any are. purpose? And are they allowed as community groups to accept donations from insurance companies and other private groups? The prohibition is against receiving compensation for enrolling people in coverage. I understand, but if they get donations in a, in a general sense. Are they permitted to do that? Uh, I, I if, think I would need to understand sure. better what the what type of donation and what could, the purpose could you, of it would be. Um, look into that, please, and get be back to us. I, I understand your concern. That's an important concern for all of us on these things, too. I also final question with regard to uh, do you think you have enough funding at this point, enough funding at this point, not future budgetary things, to take care of uh, your enrollment of people in these uh, exchanges? Uh, for for fiscal year 2013, we have enough funding, and we've uh, the president's budget requests additional funding for fiscal year 14. Thank you. My time has expired. Now recognize uh, Ms. Vigette for five Thank minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Cohen, um, the chairman talked to you about this hypothetical person, Mary Smith, who is a registered insurance broker or something, and she she can't be a navigator while she's selling insurance. That's because it would be a conflict of interest, correct? That's right. But if she if she, with all her qualifications, decided not to represent any insurance companies and not to do that, she could become a navigator. She correct? could. Because then she wouldn't have a conflict of interest, right? That's right. Now, what about these community groups? Uh, on the community groups, um, as I recall, when we did the Medicare Part D prescription drug benefit, we also had a number of community groups helping sign seniors up for that. Is that right? Correct. And that, that was kind of a similar situation because it involved asking citizens, in this case senior citizens, to sort out a number of plans and then, and then apply online, right? That's true. And so, so really you did have to have uh, trained, trained individuals, whether from community groups or other places, helping folks do this, right? You did. Okay. Now, um, I was, I, I, I'm glad that you have a lot of confidence that on October 1st, 2013, consumers are going to be able to sign up for these exchanges. I want to ask you about the states, including my state of Colorado, which are going to um, e either run their own marketplaces or their marketplace in partnership with the federal government. There's 24 of them. What's your view about the state marketplaces? How are they coming along? So I'm very encouraged by the progress the states have been making. We work with them on literally a, you know, a daily and weekly basis. We're in close contact with uh, the people at the exchanges uh, and also so uh, at the state Medicaid agencies, because that's a, a very important part of this as well. Um, I think it's fair to say that there are some states that started earlier uh, in the process and some states that start a little bit later. Uh, so we're looking very carefully at the progress that each of the states are making. Uh, and uh, our commitment is that there will be a functioning marketplace in every state on October 1. Uh, so we have uh, been working with the states to make sure that we provide the support that's needed to make that happen. And, and what about the states that got a late start? Are you giving them extra effort to help them get their exchanges up and going? That's correct. 
Okay. Um, now, can, can you um, give us a sense, the chairman and I have talked a lot about the importance of doing this oversight. What are the milestones and benchmarks we should be looking at to measure Sasayo's progress over the next few months? So I think, and we provided you, I think, with a timeline for uh, what is supposed to be happening and what will be happening over the next several months. I think the keys are uh, that we are on schedule and on track with the uh, IT build that we're doing, which is clearly an important part of this. Uh, and as I mentioned, we achieved a big milestone earlier this month with the QHP app uh, submission process. Uh, the Federal Data Hub is going to be moving, uh, is in testing now, will be continuing testing through the summer. Um, and so I think it's, it's just important to take a look at each of the steps along the path and make sure that we're, we're on track. But I'm very optimistic and confident of where we are at this point. Now, Mr. Cohen, a couple months ago, you got a question, or you, at a conference you said, quote, it's only prudent to not assume everything is going to work perfectly on day one and to make sure that we've got plans in place to address things that may happen, end quote. You also said that as we get closer to October 1, quote, we will be in a position to better know which contingency plans we actually have to implement, end quote. That seems a little in contrast to what you're saying this morning. Can you explain uh, what that comment meant and... Um, if that means that HHS is not going to be ready to implement the law? I'd be happy to, and I think, you know, sometimes when things get reported, the context gets a little lost. I've so. never noticed that before. <laughs> <laughs> I was speaking specifically not about whether we'd be ready in an Operation October 1. I was speaking, uh, really, uh, Congresswoman, to some of the comments that you made in your opening statement, that we know that when big programs begin, sometimes things aren't perfect on day one, and you have to make improvements, and, and it's only prudent to be prepared for the things that might happen um, that you could do better. And we are, uh, like all federal agencies, subject to guidelines that are published by the National uh, Institute of uh, Standards and Technology for when you do an IT project. And so you have to be prepared with mitigation strategies in case something doesn't work exactly the way you expected. But we will be up and operational October 1. I don't have any can questions you tell us, Can you tell us about the, how you're developing those mitigation strategies and are those coming along? Uh, yes, so it's it's really a constant process of uh, uh, you 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 as you do the the build, and I'm not the expert on IT, but as you do the build, you do testing, you see uh, how things are going, you you come up with strategies for how you're going to deal with. For, for example, suppose we get a lot more applications that come in on day one than we'd planned for, so you have to have redundancy, you have to be prepared for that uh, eventuality. Um, so those are the types of things that we're doing. Thank you. The uh, gentleman's time has expired. Now recognize the gentleman from Texas uh, for five minutes, Dr. Burgess. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So, Mr. Cohen, let's uh, go back to that AHIP quote about uh, which contingency plans you actually have to implement. Now, the Secretary was here last week, and I asked her about contingency plans, and she said there are no contingency plans. Every, everything will be ready. So which is it? Everything will be ready, or you're planning for contingencies? Uh, everything will be ready. But we're also planning for anything that uh, when we go into operation, if the, if the situations come up uh, that we need to address, we will be ready to address those situations and make sure that the experience for American consumers is uh, as, as seamless and as, uh, as, as good as it can be. Well, the committee would benefit actually from, from seeing some of those contingencies. Um, let me just ask you this. Would it be fair to say that closing the enrollment on the pre-existing condition insurance plan, was that a contingency? Uh, closing enrollment on the pre-existing pre condition plan was something that we did um, because it was the prudent thing to do in light of the fact that we had a certain amount of money, $5 billion, oh, to spend on that program. Did you have a contingency plan to close enrollment in PSIP that this committee was unaware of last year? I think we were looking very carefully at the expenditures of the program, and we were committed to, as careful stewards of the money that had been appropriated, us to do whatever was needed to live within the money. Yeah, that but here's the point. I mean, the secretary comes in and says there are no contingency plans. You're telling me that a year ago there was a con contingency plan to deal with the pre-existing conditions program. Um, well, I didn't. We I need didn't, to I didn't know. say that. I didn't say that. I said. Well, we it were, sounded like you said that, and if we take it out of context, which we will. Uh, that's <laughs> that's how it will be reported by your friends in the press over here. Look, we got a level of descoping. So are you actively discussing descoping, reducing the scope of the Affordable Care Act when the rollout occurs? No. That is not, I mean, I'm, I'm remind you, you're under oath. So yes. 
when we call you back in here next year to talk about this, there is no plan to narrow the scope of the Affordable Care Act. We, we, have, uh, we intend to implement fully the Affordable Care Act. We have announced already some portions that uh, will be put off to 2015, but at this point I don't anticipate any descoping of the Affordable Care Act. No. And yet, you know, you look at the people who signed, wanted to sign up for the pre-existing program, and in their parlance they've been descoped out of that, uh, the availability of that program, have they not? Well, the... The pre-existing condition program was always meant to be temporary, and those the cir circumstances of those people really point to exactly why we needed the Affordable Care Act. Yeah, but because you know those what? people were not able to get health insurance coverage at all. Building a bridge doesn't do you any good if it doesn't get to the other side, and these people now fall into this eight-month chasm, uh, and that's and that's a problem. What about now the shop exchanges that were were much uh, extolled as a virtue of the Affordable Care Act and. And now those are going to be delayed. Well, not really delayed, but you'll only have one choice instead of the competition that was advertised amongst these plans. Well, and I think that's what Senator Rockefeller was talking about. Wait a minute. This is a, a serious misfire. Let, let's be clear. Employers will have choice. They can choose among the, the plans that are available uh, in the shop. And we believe that employers uh, will have more choice under uh, the Affordable Care Act than they did before. The one-year... Uh, transition uh, to uh, affects only employees' choice and whether employers can offer more than one plan to their employees in the federally facilitated market. Again, I would just offer the observation that sounds like a narrowing in scope to, uh, at least to me, maybe it doesn't to other people, but it does to me. So let me ask you a question about taking the money from the prevention fund. Did someone in your department make the decision to take the money from the prevention fund to, to fund these navigators? Within Sasayo, no. So who made the decision? The secretary. So can you perhaps talk a little bit about how your department has been using the money that the secretary moved from the prevention fund? The, the portion of the um, prevention fund money that um, Sasayo is using goes to the $54 million funding opportunity announcement for navigator grants. So are you going to take other money from the prevention fund? I'm not aware of that at this point, no. But it's the secretary who has the transfer authority under the law. So unless she were to level with us, and I promise you she didn't last week, unless she were to level with us about what the future plans are, we would have, you would have no way of knowing, we would have no way of knowing. That secret is locked up with the secretary. Thank you, Chairman. The gentleman's time has expired. Now recognize uh, Mr. Waxman for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's so amazing to me the Republicans are complaining that money was taken from the prevention program to help pay for the implementation of the Affordable Care Act after the Republicans denied the administration funds to implement the Affordable Care Act. It's like the kid who killed his mother and father and then said, well, I'm, you got to be careful about, you have, you have to care for me because I'm an orphan. They're the ones who are impeding this uh, legislation from being implemented and forcing the administration to make these kind of choices. But they're now making a conscious choice to take the Prevention Public Health Fund to pay for a short period of time for this pre-existing condition insurance uh, program that's supposed to go out of existence at the end of this year. The, um, the, this pre-existing condition insurance program, or PSIP, was part of the Affordable Care Act. It isn't something the Republicans authored into law. It was part of the Affordable Care Act that they voted against. And in February of this year, CCIO, your uh, agency, announced that enrollment would be suspended to ensure that the program's funds, which were capped, would be able to pay the claims of existing enrollees. This is what happened when you cap a program. They want to cap Medicare. They want to cap Medicaid. That means if you run out of money, you run out of services. Now, was this decision made because, or why was this decision made? Well, you've stated it, Congressman. When we had a certain amount of money uh, that was authorized for the program, our, our number one priority obviously was to make sure that those people who were already enrolled in the program got continuity of care to the end of the year. So we're talking about 107,000 enrollees, isn't that correct? Um, it's at least that many, yes. Okay. These individuals will be able to receive their benefits throughout the end, till the end of this year, is that correct? Correct. Okay. And am I correct that the P 
PCIF program was always meant to be a temporary bridge to full ACA implementation in 2014 when insurers would be barred from discriminating against people with pre-existing conditions? That's right. Okay. And will those uninsured individuals who cannot get access to the PCIF program now be able to get access to affordable quality health care coverage when the ACA goes fully into effect in January? That's right. Insurers won't be able to turn them away, and they won't be able to charge them more just because they're sick. Um, that's, to me, quite amazing that the Republicans suddenly want to champion a program for a few months, uh, which is a bridge until people get to what is a much more sane uh, way to handle the matter. People in this pre-existing program till the end of the year, we don't pay all their expenses, do we? They have to buy their insurance. That's right. And is that going to be the same price as other people's insurance? Who it, are not under the PSIP program, it is about the price of other people's insurance today, unlike state high-risk pools where the cost to uh, uh, enrollees is typically much higher. Okay. Uh, we've talked about the Affordable Care Act being fully implemented in 2014, but many key benefits and protections from the law are already in place. And I want to ask you how Americans are already benefiting from the law. The ACA prohibits insurers from denying coverage for children with pre-existing conditions right now. Isn't that correct? That's right. And how many children are there with pre-existing health conditions? Uh, as many as 17 million. Uh, uh, 17 million people. We didn't have to create a fund for them. We just said they're going to have to be covered right now. The others will be covered in January. That's right. Covered without being discriminated against. The law also bans annual and lifetime coverage limits. Isn't that correct? It did. And when did this ban go into effect? Uh, in September of 2010. And how many Americans are benefiting from this provision of the Affordable Care Act? Approximately 105 million. The ACA also ends some of the insurance industry's most harmful abuses, including policy rescissions. Uh, Mr. Cohn, for folks who aren't experts in the insurance industry, tell us what are these rescissions? So insurance, uh, before the Affordable Care Act, insurers uh, uh, often had a policy of what's called post-claim underwriting. So they would wait to see if someone got sick and started having a lot of health claims, and then they would go back to look at their application and see if they could find something in the application that maybe was mistakenly uh, entered, it was incorrect, and then they would say, we're going to take away your policy retroactively so that we don't have to pay for any of those claims. So when Republicans voted against the Affordable Care Act, they were voting to let the insurance companies do this, this, this rescission, which is taking away your insurance coverage when you need it, even though you paid for it. That's correct. Thank you. The you know, gentleman's time has expired. I now recognize uh, Mr. Scalise for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Appreciate you having this hearing. Um, thank you, Mr. Cohen, for coming. I, yesterday uh, was in my district before I flew back here to D.C., and there was a a panel on the health care law that was held at a, a local hospital in my district. And, uh, you know, I was one of the people that was speaking on that panel, uh, and there were a number of people in the, in the healthcare care industry, people that, that have insurance. And it just seemed to be an, an underlying theme that, that continued to go through uh, that room that, that nobody is ready for this law, nobody knows how it's going to work for them, and, and most people are really concerned that the good health care they have, they're in jeopardy of losing. Uh, and, again, this is something I hear all the time when I'm back in my district talking to small businesses, uh, talking to families who, who have health care, that they're now having real concerns about whether or not they're going to be able to keep that. I mean, do you, are you out of touch with this, or do you hear these real concerns? And, and I talk to my colleagues from other states, and they're hearing the same things. I mean, are you hearing these things? I mean, I think it's important to keep in mind that for the – Many millions of Americans who have health care through their employer who empl that employs more than 50 people, they're largely unaffected by the Affordable Care Well, I'll give you an example. I met recently with the owner of Whole Foods. They have something like 30,000 employees. Uh, this is a very large company, a very well-respected company nationally. Uh, they have health care that their employees really like. Their, their employees actually get to vote on the benefits. Uh, it's a very highly successful plan. They, they manage to control costs. Uh, they beat the industry average, and, and yet they still – provide a plan that their employees like, and under the current law, from what they see, their plan is not even eligible. Their 30-plus thousand employees that have good health care they like are right now at risk of losing that coverage. 
you know, the old promise, if you like what you have, you can keep it. It was broken to those 30,000. That was one example. I mean, do you even aware of that? Well, I can't speak to specifically to we that You ought to find example, out about it. What a I can... real life example of a real company that's a well-respected company that has good health care, their employees really like, and they're right now at risk of losing it because of this law. But, but, but I, I want to walk through you some specific, some specific things that we've been seeing, uh, you know, and start with the pre-existing coalition, uh, the condition insurance program. Uh, y'all did, uh, y'all did actually stop, uh, stop taking new new enrollees in that program, right? Because it, it ran out of money. Uh, we stopped taking new enrollees to make sure we wouldn't run out of money. All right. So the the early retiree reinsurance program that was supposed to last until 2014. I think it was it was discontinued in 2011. Is that right? Well, I think the success of that program showed the great need for it. And so enrollment's closed on it? It was so uh, successful that somebody can't get in it right now? We are paying out claims now only uh, based on money that's coming back to us. So can someone enroll in it today? Oh, enroll in it today? No. No, so they can't enroll in it. Uh, some requirements of the Small Business Health Options Program were delayed. Is that correct? The shop will be operating in October. The one provision that is but did you delay? But did you delay some of those? Uh, provisions one aspect of the shop which okay, is the employee so that's, choice we have that's been delayed the class program that was that was supposed to be Obamacare's long-term care program that was actually repealed by Congress wasn't it uh, that's not one of mine so no it's not <laughs> one of anybody's anymore because it got repealed by Congress it was so bad uh, and fortunately hopefully none of this is yours anymore because we could repeal the whole thing but but want to hit one more of them the 1099 requirement that we were hearing horror stories about uh, that was getting ready to take effect. Again, part of Obamacare. Uh, the horror stories were so bad that, that Congress, Republican and Democrat alike, agreed to repeal that too, right? That's my understanding, though. Again, that's the truth. And it's not, yours, it's not your problem anymore either because we repealed that. Uh, so there's five examples right there. Five examples, some, some fairly small components, uh, but then you're here telling us that probably the largest component that you're going to have to deal with, and, and, and that's these exchanges. Uh, they're 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 going to be ready. You think they're going to be fine in a couple of months when it's time for them to come online? Yet I just gave you five examples of programs that were either delayed, uh, closed enrollment because they they weren't ready for prime time, or just outright repealed because they were so bad. But then you're going to tell us that the biggest part is going to be okay. We're on track, and I can just point to the successes that we've had so far in developing. Uh, I, just the I just highlighted five examples of failures. In fact, I don't know if you know this, one of the lead architects of Obamacare, Senator Baucus, just last week said, quote, I just see a huge train wreck coming down. He's, he's not even running for re-election, but, I mean, he, he just said that last week. I mean, do you dispute what he said last week about the health care law being a huge train wreck coming down? We are on track and on schedule. On, on track. It's, we'll, the problem we, is there's a train are, coming at you on that track. We, 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 according, we, to, according to one of the architects, that's not me. I voted against it. Somebody that actually was helping push this thing through said it's about to be a huge train wreck. We will be like, ready to help millions of Americans enroll in, in quality, affordable I hope coverage. you're ready to help the millions of Americans that are about to be dealing with this train wreck that's coming. Uh, because, again, when you talk to real people out there in the real world, big and small, they don't know how they're going to be able to keep the health care they like for their employees, and that's a big concern of mine. Yield back. Gentleman's time has expired. Now I recognize Mr. Tonka for five minutes. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Cohen, thank you for appearing before the subcommittee today. And the Affordable Care Act's Prevention and Public Health Fund have been subject to ongoing attacks since uh, their inception, inception under the Affordable Care Act. Um, the Republicans have repeatedly sought to repeal or drain those funds. Um, they argue that it is a slush fund and that the resources are being used inappropriately to pay for public health lobbying efforts. Um, let's take the opportunity to set the record straight on exactly how the prevention fund is or isn't being used. Um, I know the prevention fund isn't under your supervision, but can you give us a general overview of the HHS agencies and public health programs and activities that have been and will be supported through the fund? So I'd be happy to try, Congressman. That is not directly my area, and I'd be happy to get back to you with information on that. But I do know that um, the prevention fund has been used extensively in uh, tobacco cessation, in wellness programs. Uh, and in other uh, programs uh, designed to get preventive care to people. Uh, and with respect to the work that we're doing, um, we know that when people have health insurance, they get preventive care and they get care for uh, the illnesses that they do have earlier and they get better treatment and it's more cost effective. 
So uh, I think that the use of the Prevention of Public Health Fund to help uh, stand up the, these exchanges and make people sure that people know about them and take advantage of the benefits that they have to offer uh, is really you know, right within the scope of what the fund is intended to do. Um, thank you. And do state and local governments uh, receive any of the, uh, of the dollars? You know, I don't know the answer to that. I'm sorry. Um, is there a way you can check and get Absolutely. back to us, happy please? Absolutely. Yes. And is any of the prevention fund being used by its grantees to uh, support local lobbying efforts? No, not that I'm aware of. But again, I can check into that and get back to you. And what is the department's policy on the use of federal grant dollars for lobbying activities? It's not permitted. Okay. With respect to using this fund to help implement the Affordable Care Act and implement the health insurance marketplaces, I understand that you and the rest of the administration are in a very difficult position uh, because Republicans in Congress have refused to provide any funding to support this critical program and help the implementation work smoothly. HHS was forced to leverage and reallocate existing resources to provide short-term and immediate funding. So my question is, can you please explain to us how the Secretary has used her transfer authority uh, to help implement the Affordable Care Act? So it's my, the Secretary has used the statutory authority that she has to transfer funds within HHS. Um, she's used some funding from the Prevention Fund, as you mentioned, uh, and she's uh, used uh, some funding from the Non-Recurring Expense Fund for, for particularly for uh, IT projects. Um, and those are the sources that she's used in addition to the implementation fund that was contained in the Affordable Care Act. And the IT projects that you're talking about would that's the work that we're doing to, to get the marketplaces ready for, for uh, October. For October 1st. And how will HHS ensure that programs supported by the Prevention Fund won't be negatively impacted uh, due to the uh, reallocation, if you will, of the funds? Well, I mean, obviously, the, the, the President's budget for 2014 requests additional funding for the work that we're doing. So the hope is that going forward, um, we'll, if we'll get that funding and we'll be able to rely on that rather than having to use any funding under the Prevention Fund. Um, I thank you for your response. The um, Prevention Fund is um, a significant, a smart, and worthwhile investment, obviously, in improving health um, uh, situations for uh, customers and reducing costs. Um, it's unfortunate that you uh, had to reallocate some of these funds to pay for implementation. And I think it's unfortunate that uh, uh, my Republican colleagues have been so unwilling to provide the basic funding requested by the administration to implement the health care laws. So, you know, I appreciate the insight that you've provided today. Um, if you can get back to us with some of those other uh, concerns, that would be appreciated. But. Um, you know, this down payment is the effort to uh, provide for a better outcome and to uh, achieve the ultimate goals of the Affordable Care Act. So with all of that, um, I thank you, uh, thank you for your response here. And uh, with that, Mr. Chair, I'll yield back. Thank you. Uh, gentleman yields back. Now recognize Mr. Harper for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Cohen, thank you uh, for uh, allowing us this opportunity on very important uh, issues that we need to discuss. And I want to follow up a little bit on what the gentleman from Louisiana just asked you about uh, the pre-existing condition insurance program, the fund, where we stopped enrollment, uh, where you had to stop enrollment. I, I was under the impression that it was stopped because the money was exhausted, but you said that you stopped so you wouldn't run out of money. Would you explain that in a little more detail? Sure. Um, you know, as with any uh, uh, program like this, uh, claims come in and have to get paid out over a period of time. So we have to project forward for the people that we have enrolled in the program now. We need to make sure that we can cover their costs. Through You're anticipated or projected or or. For, for the rest of the year. So we, we, we look at how much we're spending and how much we have, and obviously we know that we can't go beyond what's been appropriated. So that's, that was the basis for the decision. All right. How much money was left when it was closed, when enrollment was stopped? You know, I would have to go back and, and, and get you those precise numbers. Can, I don't, you, can I, you provide that information? Yes, I'd be to happy us. to. I don't want to misstate it, so I'd, I'd prefer to go back and get you that information. You know, pre existing, I, I think uh, everybody here is you know, always concerned about pre existing. Uh, but before, or even before the implementation of this, uh, the largest insurer in my home state 
already provided uh, pre-existing coverage for dependent children up to age 25, not quite 26, but 25, mm -hmm. and, uh, and those things were, were, were there and available. But what I want to know is you said there was not enough money left, so you had to stop, but isn't this, this money that we're talking about today that uh, Ms. Sibelius uh, has available to her under the preventive care, could not some of that have been instead of used for navigators or something else? Didn't she have the authority to transfer some of that money that was available to her, the billions of dollars available to her, to help prop this program up for, uh, for pre-existing? Uh, that's not something that we've looked at, uh, Congressman, but I'm sure we can. We well, can... It, well, I don't know whether I need you to provide an answer. We know that's the truth. She has the ability. That money is available. I mean, the money's almost like a slush fund for her to use. And so we're going to do what should have been done, which is to take this money that's there available to use to help these people that are sick and to help those with pre-existing. I mean, how can we say that some of this money has been used for uh, a pet neutering project and some others were used to, to, for lobbying efforts uh, regarding uh, soda taxes. I mean, some, I mean that's, that's inconscionable that, that we would use money for something like that but yet deny uh, care to those that are in most need. So uh, I, would, I would encourage you to, to, to even now as this is going on, there, there are funds available within the program that could be shifted over to pre-existing, but we're going to take care of it with legislation today that uh, it's interesting that even though some on the other side have been very critical, uh, there are many uh, health advocacy groups, patient advocacy groups that support this bill that's going to come up for a vote later today. Now, I'd like to talk now for a minute about the sequester impact, if we could. You know, we've had this administration cancel White House tours, but yet have concerts uh, that cost over $400,000 of taxpayer money. We've had an Easter egg roll. We're going to have, I guess, another Congressional White House Christmas ball. All these things are done. TSA talking about long waits at the airport. Uh, even though they ordered $50 million worth of new uniforms before sequester kicked in. So I think the public realizes the political game and shift that's, been, that's taking place in this. So I want to know what you've done as far as the sequester, how that's impacted you, and uh, if there's anything there that we should expect as far as furloughs or impact on, on patient care. Uh, within CMS, uh, we have been uh, working very hard to avoid the necessity for furloughs. We are under a hiring freeze, so I can't, uh, I can't hire, I can't replace people who leave, um, which is a serious issue for me in terms of trying to run a program. If, if, if people move on to other jobs, I can't, I can't hire to replace them. Uh, and um, there, there, there have been, a, you know, we've applied the sequester according to the advice that we've been given uh, um, across the board as we're, okay. as we're required to do. I, I'm almost out of time, but I, are you telling me then that this administration is furloughing air traffic controllers vital to public safety in this country, but yet you're not furloughing anybody in your agency? Well, in effect, we are because we can't, we can't replace people who leave. So but that's, we're, that's we're, not the same. I mean, we're talking about a, at least a 15 percent furlough of current air traffic controllers resulting in delays and perhaps safety concerns, but yet this has been a selective political uh, item by the administration. I yield back. General Yields back, and I recognize the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Green, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I share my colleague's concern, but uh, when that sequester was passed, it was passed by a huge bipartisan vote. And, uh, you know, you can't vote for something and say, oh, I wish it wasn't happening because it's happening, whether it be a CMS or TSA or anywhere else. But let me get to the health exchanges. Um, I have a question related to exchanges, important goal that I think we both share, ensuring that part of the successful implementation of the Affordable Care Act, people have access to the care they need. Uh, your agency has released a series of letters to issues relating to qualified health plans, QHPs, and the insurance exchanges uh, and the essential community partners. In your letter, you state CMS urges issuer issuers to offer provider networks with robust ECP participation. Uh, do you agree that it's important that ECPs such as community health centers uh, can be considered as an integral part of the uh, qualified health plans? Yes. Networks? Yes. And is CMS encouraging that? We are. I have another related question, but I'll submit that uh, for the record. Um, and uh, 
On the topic of the premiums, we heard repeatedly last month concerns about the potential rate increases under the Affordable Care Act, the concern that there will be some people, mainly healthier young men, who will pay higher premiums under the Affordable Care Act than they pay in the individual market. Uh, I'd like to understand more detail. First, can you get, tell us a bit about how rates are structured for different groups in the individual market now based on factors such as age, sex, and health status? Yes, so uh, in, in the market today, uh, issuers are allowed to uh, uh, vary rates uh, depending on uh, the health status of a person, whether they're sick and they are expected to have higher costs. They're allowed to uh, charge women uh, more than men and treat being a woman as a pre-existing okay. condition. Let me, uh, so older and sicker people pay more and women pay more for health care right now. That's right. How would the rates be structured under the Affordable Care Act go into effect? Uh, health status won't be able to be used as a factor. Gender won't be able to use as a factor. Age still can be used as a factor, but the impact is limited uh, compared to what it is today. Uh, and um, where you live is can be used as a factor. So under the Affordable Care Act, the risk will be pooled. Insurance cannot charge more for women. And those with underlying health conditions, they're limited on how they can, how they can charge older people more than younger people. Is that correct? That's correct. And... Um, I know uh, there are groups like young, healthy males that look like they might pay higher premiums. My understanding is a number of factors that mitigate these premium increases. First, many of these individuals may qualify for Medicaid, so they're able to receive coverage without paying premiums. Is that correct? Yes. In addition, the Affordable Care Act now allows young adults to remain on their parents' health care till 26. Correct. And that was part of the Affordable Care Act. It was. And as I recall, being here in 2009, we didn't, there was not a Republican vote for moving that to 26 years old. But anyway, let me go on. Uh, what about those who are not on Medicaid or their parents' health plan? Am I correct that they qualify for tax credits or premium assistance that will reduce their insurance costs? Correct, up to 400 percent of the federal poverty level. Okay. And to what extent will this mitigate the impact of premium increases? It will be significant. Okay. Finally, individuals under the age of 30 may purchase so-called young and invincible plans on health insurance exchanges. I know I used to think that away when I was in my 20s, but since I joined Medicare last year, I know I'm not. Uh, can you tell me how these plans may, uh, will work and how they will reduce cost? Absolutely. So that's a high deductible plan, which means that for your, your, your typical doctor's visit, it won't cover it. But if something serious were to happen to you, you become ill or in an accident, it will cover you. And those plans, uh, we expect, will be very affordable for younger people. Okay. The Affordable Care Act contains a lot of new tools like rate review and the medical loss ratios that I've come from the state of Texas and we typically don't regulate anything in health insurance except policies. Um, and to me, one of the best reforms in the Affordable Care Act was the 80% loss ratio. Because as an employer of a small business years ago, I was not sure that uh, the premiums we were paying were coming back into uh, medical benefits. Uh, but we only had 13 employees, so we didn't have a choice. But now that small employer will know that 80% of their premiums will come back into medical benefits. That's exactly right, and, and uh, insurers have to pay back over $1 billion in rebates to uh, consumers and businesses uh, in 2012 because of that program. Well, and again, like I said, that seems like one of the best reforms, although there are a lot of things in there. And, and again, uh, you don't need to say this, but I also know that we tried to work on that bill in our committee, uh, and we, we did have a markup. And, uh, and again, I didn't expect many Republicans to vote for it, and none of them did. But there were a lot of good things in the Affordable Care Act that people had talked about on a bipartisan basis for decades. And I realize I'm out of time, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Hey, gentlemen, time has expired now. Uh, go to the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Olson, for five minutes. I thank the chair. And good morning, Mr. Cohen. Good morning. And I know I don't have to say this, but I'm going to say it anyway. I've been elected three times by the people of Southeast Texas, my home, Texas 22, to be the member here in Congress, to their representative. And quite frankly, they're frightened. And I don't use that word lightly, but they are frightened about Obamacare and what it's going to do to their health care. Will it become more expensive? Will they have access? Will they keep it? Many promises have been made, and many have already been broken. They want and deserve answers to my questions. So I ask you to respect them and directly answer the questions I ask. 
In a prior life, I spent nine years as a staffer in the United States Senate. I know what a field buster looks like. And I haven't seen one today, so thank you for that. But if I smell a fist filibuster, I will abruptly interrupt and ask the questions. So thank you for that. But I'm confused. I mean, last week, right here in this room, the Secretary said that there are no contingency plans for the state basis changes. And yet, Mr. Cohen, you here today are saying there are some plans. So are there plans, contingency plans, or aren't there plans, yes or no? We will be ready to operate October 1 of 2013. We are preparing for the eventuality that different parts of the system that we're building uh, may not work perfectly and may need to be uh, improved. Uh, and those are the kinds of plans that we're working on. We're doing testing uh, and we are doing everything that we can to make sure that everything works as well as possible. But we know that in any large project. Okay, that's great, sir. It sounds like I'm a naval aviator. You're preparing for the worst and planning for the best, hoping for the best. Is that correct? Yes or no? Um, we are realistic. Preparing for the worst. We are realistic. We are realistic in our planning, and we are. We will be ready. Okay. One further question, sir. I've talked to many family businesses back home about Obamacare and its impact on their businesses. These guys provide health insurance to their employees, and. Uh, Every single one I've talked to, every single one has told me, Congressman, I provide health care for my employees because it's good for my business, it's a recruiting tool, retention tool, but I have to compete in the market. If this thing goes down, it costs me anywhere between I've heard five to eight thousand, nine thousand dollars per employee per year. If that if the health care bill comes to pass and the exchanges don't work out, I will dump my people in the exchanges. You know, because I'll pay a two, three thousand dollar fine. That's much more benefit for business. They're not going to be the first one to pull the trigger. They're waiting because they want to do it for their employees, but they'll have to because the market will demand them to. Are you prepared? Have you? I mean, one question: Have you met out about out in America and heard this complaint or concern from small businesses? Yeah, I have spoken to uh, small business owners and and um, representatives of you know small business associations. I think it's important to, to keep in mind that the offer rate for small businesses of, of health insurance has been declining dramatically over the past decade and more because it's not affordable. Uh, and that was before there ever was an Affordable Care Act. Uh, I think there are a number of very important provisions in the law that will make uh, coverage more affordable for small businesses, not you know, one of which certainly is a tax credit that's a, for eligible employers that can pay up to 50 percent of the cost of providing health care to their employees. Again, sir, every business I've talked to in this situation has said they are planning to drop their health care insurance. I mean, that's in stark contrast to what you're saying here. I know what you're saying, but again, the bottom line on America is there are going to be changes. People will lose their health care because of Obamacare. And one final question. My state of Texas is going to go on the federal exchange. And uh, you know, so obviously enrollment on October 1st, full out go on January 1st. Um, one of the problems with D.C. is our eagerness to impose a one-size-fits-all solution to all of our problems. Uh, it won't work for the state exchanges. My parents live in Vermont. They retired up there. And I can assure you that Vermont's challenges are much different than Texas's challenges. Um, heck, Texas has a one-size-fits-all problem within the state. I mean, the Valley, Rio Grande Valley there has a high epi epidemic of diabetes. West Texas has a high epidemic of skin cancer compared to the rest of the state. The urban environments have more asthmas, more, more issues in that area. So how do you address these differences? Are you going to have some sort of, with the federal exchanges, address the differences between states? Congressman, I think you know that Texas has one of the highest uninsured rates in the entire country. And uh, the Affordable Care Act and Medicaid expansion and the exchanges offers an opportunity to Texas to get a lot of those people enrolled in coverage. And we welcome Texas's involvement with us and a partnership with us, as many, many, many states have, to develop uh, a marketplace that is best suited to the needs of the people in Texas. Um, I'm, I'm I'm Thank you, sir. Thank you. Now I'll turn to the gentlelady from Florida, Ms. Castor, for five minutes. Well, thank you, Chairman Murphy and Ranking Member DeGette for uh, calling this hearing because I think it is very important that we have substantial oversight of the implementation of the Affordable Care Act. Uh, the good news is that, that so far families across America have seen uh, vast improvements. 
already, uh, even before the marketplaces are set up and people are enrolling in, in health insurance. You know, some of the ones that are popular in my community, uh, young people age 26 now can stay on their parents' insurance. That has meant a meaningful change to th over 3 million uh, young people across America. Uh, Medicare has gotten better, it's gotten stronger, uh, whether it's your prescription drugs that are more affordable or those new preventative services when you go in for checkups. Uh, that's a very meaningful change for our parents and grandparents. And then the one that doesn't get as much attention but should are the rebates that have come back from insurance companies. Uh, in the state of Florida alone, uh, 1.2 million of uh, Florida families have gotten an insurance rebate because of the terms of the Affordable Care Act that say, you know, uh, when you pay your premiums and your co-pays, that money should go to actual health care and health insurance rather than profits and marketing and, and CEO salaries. Uh, that has brought back to the state of Florida $123 million right back into the pockets of Florida families at a time when they could really use those extra couple hundred dollars. So thank you for that. And now we're on the cusp of such a positive change for families across America. So many that have not had access to those important doctor visits or being able to call the nurse and get the checkups that they need or if with a chronic condition get the uh, significant health services that they need. So Mr. Cohen, I want to ask you about the outreach efforts, especially the navigators. We've talked a little bit about that already today. This is going to be a very substantial effort as HHS begins the outreach rollout, how you inform families about signing up, how you uh, educate uh, families and small businesses about their insurance options. Uh, I know that some are concerned that some of the Affordable Care Act dollars are going to fund these outreach efforts, but how else are we going to get, are we going to educate uh, everyone? I think it's all hands on deck. We need the insurance companies here. We need uh, community groups, the community health centers, doctors, nurses, and what I hear at home is everyone is ready to join in this effort. Uh, but could you talk about, kind of set the stage for this, we have 50 million uninsured in this country. Uh, people are hungry for information. Wouldn't you agree? Could you, uh, could you talk about your, right here at the outset, what you're going to be doing in the coming months? Uh, thank you. I'd, I'd be happy to. First of all, as you mentioned, uh, the, the $54 million for grants to community organizations and church groups and Indian tribes and other uh, uh, groups to uh, uh, service navigators. We've, uh, we're allocating that money based on the number of uninsured in each state. So we're going to try to put that money where we need it the most. Um, uh, in addition to that, uh, there's going to be uh, uh, a uh, sort of a media campaign, you know, just sort of to get people to understand more about the law and the benefits that uh, it can bring to them. Um, uh, and we'll be directing people to go online to healthcare.gov where uh, beginning in June the call center will be up and healthcare.gov will be um, uh, change its focus to really be a consumer site uh, that will be there to provide information to consumers and help them get ready for the steps that they will need to take beginning in October for en enrollment. Um, and as you mentioned, I, I'm, I, I'm hearing a tremendous amount of excitement out there in the community from foundations, from uh, the insurance companies that obviously have a real incentive to get people uh, to come buy their products. So I think there's going to be a, a really a multifaceted effort to make sure that people know uh, what, what's in store for and, them. And looking at the, the states that have such high numbers of uninsured, California, Texas, uh, New Mexico, Florida, Florida, we have about between 20 and 25 percent are uninsured, do not have health insurance. So that's, these are going to be critical areas. Uh, in many of those areas, English is not the first language. Could you talk about uh, American citizens that don't, uh, your outreach in, in bilingual uh, and diverse communities? And then I do think it's important to have insurance agents and brokers involved. If I have a large outreach event with the community health centers, doctors, nurses, and I have the brokers there, is there any, they're not a navigator, right. but can they participate in those kind of outreach efforts? So, so thank you. So on the language side, one of the qualifications uh, for uh, being a navigator is that you be able to serve people, you know, in cultural and 
and linguistically appropriate ways, and we definitely are expecting to get applications from groups that are specifically going to target uh, specific you know, groups that are not um, English language proficient. Um, we're working very closely with the agent broker community. I've had a number of, of meetings with uh, their trade associations and with uh, agents and brokers directly, and we've come up with a way for agents and brokers to easily be able to uh, enroll people uh, in the, in, through the marketplaces, and we are definitely expecting that they will play a very significant role, particularly with regard to small business, where th as they do today. Thank you very Generally much. Generally, as time is spread, I'm curious, are you asking for perhaps a, a written uh, statement on that? Because I think the chair would like to know that as well to help our people who may be in other groups. Yes, Mr. Chairman, I think it's very important, all hands on deck here for enrollment. So you'll get back a written response to the committee on that? Sure. Brief one. Thank you very much. Now I recognize the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Griffith, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I was a little bit surprised that you said people, you know, that you talk to, there's an excitement out there. The excitement that I'm finding in my district is kind of like uh, the excitement that Mr. Olson found in his district in Texas is that people are scared and they're concerned. And I've got businessmen who come to me and say, I don't know what I'm going to do. Do I lay off, you know, some of my employees in order to get down under 50? What do I do? Of course, the Commonwealth of Virginia, which I represent, uh, has indicated that they're going to have all of their part-time employees go under uh, 29 hours so that they won't have to cover them on insurance. And, uh, you know, it's, it's becoming uh, kind of interesting to see because you have, you know, people who were promised if you like your insurance, you can keep it. But uh, just recently, I think within the last 48 hours, a proposal passed in the state of uh, Washington out of the Senate. It, it's probably not going to pass the House. But it passed out of the state of Washington where they currently uh, cover employees down to 20 hours, but they're going to take their, their state employees and move them into the exchanges is the proposal under the plan. They would give them $2 per hour bonus in pay that would help defray the cost of premium costs, but they won't be able to keep the insurance they had. And I wonder what your thoughts are on that, that folks are being forced out of the plans they like because uh, the, the states and, and look, Let's face it, if the states can't afford it, a lot of businesses can't afford it either. The states are doing things that are pushing people away from either the number of hours they work or the insurance that they, that they like and that they had. Well, first of all, you know, the law does provide that grandfathered plans uh, uh, are not subject to, uh, you know, most of the provisions uh, of the Affordable Care Act. So it... It is possible for uh, uh, employers to keep the plan that they like if they had a plan in place before and they and it's not changed significantly. They can keep the insurance that that they uh, well, the they employer have. can keep it, but in this case, they're they're looking at moving the employees off of that plan and into the exchanges because it will save the state of Washington 120 million dollars. Well, I, you know, obviously, I don't know specifically what's happening in Washington. I think there are a great number of factors that go into uh, employers' decisions about how many hours their employees work and how many employees they employ. Health care is certainly one of those. But we know that under the existing system, uh, uh, which has been broken, uh, employers have found it uh, difficult or impossible to get affordable coverage, particularly with a small employer. Just one employee who has a serious illness can drive the cost for that employer to the point where the employer can no longer afford to provide that coverage. That can no longer happen under the Affordable Care Act. Well, let me tell you what's going on. I mean, I, I, I will tell you that the, the, the excitement that you referenced is excitement of the negative, not excitement of the positive. And I'm going to quote now from the Olympian, uh, their dot-com or their online publication, because they, they go on to cite worker-friendly lawmakers, and about, talking about that same bill, but this person was opposed to that bill, Worker-friendly lawmakers such as Democratic Senator Karen Frazier of Thurston County called the bill, quote-unquote, premature. Why, you ask? Because the precise benefits, again quoting Ms. Frazier, Senator Frazier, because the precise benefits available under the exchange, exchanges are still unknown, she said there is a chance that some workers could not afford coverage and plunge their families into poverty. Now, that's a Democratic state senator in the state of Washington who fears putting state workers into the exchanges because they won't be able to afford the coverage. How can you tell the American people, and how can you tell Senator Frazier that she's wrong 
and that she has no reason to be fear. And is that the kind of excitement you're hearing? Because that's the kind of excitement I'm hearing in my district. And obviously, Senator Karen Frazier of the state of Washington, a member of the Democrat Party, Democratic Party, has that same fear coming to her from her constituents. How do you respond to that, sir? Well, I don't know about her particular concerns. What I do know is that under the Affordable Care Act, tax credits will be available uh, to people that will make uh, insurance coverage more affordable uh, uh, beginning in 2014 than it is today. And that argument was made on the floor in the state of Washington, and Ms. Frazier wasn't convinced. Thank you, sir. I yield back my time. General Neal's back. We now recognize uh, Senator North Carolina, Mr. Butterfield, for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Cohen, for coming uh, to be with us today. Um, hopefully, uh, you have brought with you some very important information that we can all benefit from. Uh, as you uh, may know, I represent a very low-income district in North Carolina. Uh, in my whole state, we have about one and a half million uh, people who are uninsured. Uh, about one-third of those, 500,000 of those, are poor people. And about 10 percent of those live in my congressional district. And so uh, I've listened to the uh, questions and, and, and answers here today. And, and, and I can tell you that in my district, I can't speak for other districts, but in my district there is a lot of excitement. Uh, about the Affordable Care Act. Uh, the people that I represent are looking forward to it, including business people, uh, those who are rational, those who have taken the time out to, to study the benefits of the Affordable Care Act for their business. Uh, once they uh, understand it, uh, most, if not all of them, are, are ready to, uh, to embrace it. Uh, but I want to just take a few minutes to uh, drill down on the Navigator program, because you know and I know uh, that that is so critically important. Uh, I see the Navigator program as, as, as community-based individuals who will go out into the community and go to untraditional places, barbershops and beauty salons, and even knock on doors uh, to find people who would qualify uh, for the exchange. I is that correct? That's exactly right. Th these are not elitists. These are not people who will sit behind a desk and, and, and uh, push some buttons. These are people who will actually beat the pavement and go out and, and find people to, uh, first of all, to inform them about the benefits of, of the program. That's right, and ideally people who already have a track record and a history of helping people in, in, in those communities. Would this include knocking on doors, canvassing neighborhoods? Absolutely. All right. And, and, and when a door is knocked on and, and, and an individual is found who, who would potentially qualify for the program, what happens next? I, I guess there's, there's an informational uh, session with, with the individual, but once the navigator determines that, that this individual uh, uh, qualifies for, for assistance uh, for, for the tax credits, what, what happens next? Do you take them by the hand and take them to some central location and, and, and process a claim? I mean, ideally, the, the, the easiest way to get people signed up is online. So ideally, navigators would help folks who may, may not have access to a computer at home, you know, go to, uh, to, to the community organization's location and help them through an online process, which can be done. Well, let's divide it into two pieces. Let's say the, the, the citizen has a computer in their home. Will the navigator actually stay in the home, assist the individual, with the application online? They can help them walk through the application, exactly. At the request of, of the individual? At the person, of course. Yes. And if, and if the citizen does not, have, does not have access to a computer, then the navigator will enable the individual to go to, a, to an office? Ideally, or, you know, people can apply. There is a paper application, and people can apply with a paper application. So a navigator could sit down with someone across the kitchen table and go through the application and do it that way as well. And then will the navigator s see it through to completion? I is, is, there, is there a procedure for making sure that the individual follows through? The there, there can be a procedure for the navigator finding out whether um, what the result of it has been. All right. Now, now, from from what I can gather, if if an individual, let's say a single, healthy, childless adult, who makes twenty thousand dollars a year, and that individual would would qualify for tax credits through the exchange, uh, but an individual who makes ten thousand dollars, who is single and childless and healthy would qualify for Medicaid, but if a state has declined the expansion of Medicaid, the $10,000 individual will have no access uh, to insurance. Is that correct? They can still go into the exchange. Even if they are under 100% of the federal poverty line? Uh, 
they could, then they won't be they, they those people won't be getting a tax credit. You're correct. But can anyone under 100 percent of of poverty go into the exchange? Yes. So if someone makes fifty dollars a year in in income, if they if they have the capacity to pay for uh, the, the the exchange, they can go into it. Correct. So if a family member wanted to assist that low-income individual, they could, they, they could do that. They could do that. All right. All right. Thank you very much. I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Now go to the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Johnson, five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Cohen, um, has your office done any analysis of uh, the health care law of Obamacare's uh, impact on premiums? No. You no, have no, no analysis oh, in, oh, in the sense that's, that you, that's great. Uh, we're going to have a we're going to have a fun session here then. Uh, so are premiums going up or down for the I, average consumer? You testified earlier that millions of Americans uh, are that, that don't currently have insurance are going to have insurance in October or, or uh, uh, right. under the law. Uh, for the average consumer that has health care today, are their premiums going up or down? I think we have to wait and see when the plans submit their rates. But that's not. But that's not what the president promised. The president promised that supporters would see lower costs. So, uh, are, are people going to see increases or decreases in their premiums? I think at this point we have to wait and see what the, how the rates come in for for 2014. Over time. Um, people w uh, absolutely will see lower costs as we see more competition in the system, a broader risk pool. And if you look at the overall uh, uh, health care costs that people have to uh, absorb, given tax credits, lower cost sharing, they will see lower costs. So, uh, well, who's going to see lower costs? What, what demographics are going to see lower costs? Is it going to be the young? Is it going to be men? Is it going to be women? Is it going to be seniors? Who's going to see the lower costs? Well, we, we know that women today can be charged up to 50 percent more than men just because they're women. So, yes, women will see lower costs. Uh, and we know that um, uh, older people uh, can be charged often five or six times as much uh, uh, because of their age, and that's going to be limited. So they will see lower costs. Are anybody's premiums and going up? I think we have to wait and see what the rates look like that's when a, they that's come a, in. That's a theme that has persisted in this law. Wait and see. Pass it, and then let's see what happens down the road. Well, I tell you what, that's a dangerous way to navigate a ship like America's economy. Um, you know, in the um, – uh, you also write that, that these programs will keep premiums in the individual and small group markets reasonably priced. What's a reasonable price? Surely you've got some idea what a reasonable price is. You know, sitting here today, I, could, I, I don't have an answer to that question. We could certainly, um, you know, come back. I think what I can say is that we know that over the last uh, couple of years, uh, health insurance premiums have been going up at a lower rate than they have been for decades before. I mean, health insurance premiums have gone up by double digits year after year after year, and that's but, hasn't but been the American people were the promised two things. They were promised that if they liked their current coverage, they could keep it, and that costs would be lowered. You've just confirmed to me that you don't know that to be true anymore. You don't know. You're you're having to wait and see. For 2014, uh, over time, over time. You know, the, well, I just asked you it, that. Were premiums going up or down? And you said you don't know. For 2014, we have to wait and okay, see those rates. Okay, let's look out in. longer than that. Are premiums going up or down? I expect that premiums will go down relative to what they would have been for who? without the Affordable Care Act. For who? For, for everyone. For without everyone. the Affordable Care Act, they would be going up okay, higher. Okay, so then you must know then what defines some reasonable cost. If you know they're going down or you think they're going down, You've got some well, idea of what that range is. What's the, reasonable? The, the primary factor that goes into w what a health care premium is is the cost of medical care. And we all know that. That's the primary driver of health care costs. So in order to have premiums go, truly go down, we need to address uh, the cost of medical care. 
uh, and the Affordable Care Act and the administration have a number of different ways of well, We have that. a very different As far as my program is concerned. We have a very different uh, understanding of what's driving the cost of health care because, in my opinion, what's driving the cost of health care up is the bureaucracy that has now set itself up in Washington to oversee one-sixth of our economy. But let me – I've only got a little bit of time left. On the application, um, uh, one of the questions that the applicants are asked is, do you think the employer's coverage is affordable? Do you think the employer's coverage is affordable? Why do you ask this? It's what, is a, what is affordable health care, in your opinion? It, it's, it's defined in the statute. The question is asked because it's, a, it's one of the eligibility requirements, and it's defined in the statute as up to, depending on what your income level is, up to 9.5 percent of, uh, of your income. So affordable, in your opinion, is 9.5, which is almost 10 percent of a person's income for it, health care. It's not my opinion. It's what's in the law. But what is your opinion of what's affordable? I, I, don't, I don't have an opinion. Oh, that's, oh, that's good. That's I uh, got gotcha. you. I yield back. The gentleman's time has expired. Now go to the gentleman from Illinois, Ms. Schakowsky, who is recognized for five minutes. Well, Mr. Cohen, it's not surprising that from the Republican side of the aisle, the relentless drumbeat of opposition to uh, the Affordable Care Act or Obamacare, as I proudly say. Um, goes on after 33 uh, efforts to repeal the, or are successful to repeal the entire bill. But I would uh, challenge my uh, colleagues on the other side to go out and explain to at least some of their constituents, for example, the parents of children with pre-existing conditions, that they want to take away insurance to, to them, that uh, annual and lifetime coverage limits should be reinstated, um, that um, the rescissions of policies should uh, uh, once ag again go into uh, place, that uh, all the preventive health services without cost sharing ought to go back into effect, that um, the, the young people that are in their parents' policies forget it, they're off, you explain that to them. Um, that the uh, medical loss ratio requiring insurance companies to actually pay for health insurance, health coverage um, should be changed. And tell women that uh, we think you should be discriminated against. That's a good idea. Um, that about, uh, uh, I don't know how many billions of dollars we over to collectively pay more in health insurance. Um, and, and, and so, you know, you can list five problems with uh, the, the program and, uh, you know, we can list many, many more uh, good things. And we'd like to work with each other to try and correct them rather than just complain. No, the program is not perfect. Um, I wanted to um, ask you, um, we're just months away now from full implementation of Obamacare's coverage. Um, and the administration has requested additional resources to implement the law, um, and those requests have been ignored. And it seems to me the refusal of my Republican colleagues to appropriate HHS adequate resources to help implement the law is limiting our efforts to inform Americans about Obamacare's exciting new coverage options. And let me just say that when the uh, Part D was put into effect, $600,000 was spent by the Bush administration for blimps to talk about, you know, just for blimps alone. Um, so could you explain how um, Cecilio would use additional resources that the administration has requested to implement the law, and how might, how might the refusal to appropriate adequate, ac adequate resources hinder the ability of consumers to know about October 1st? Uh, thank you, Congresswoman. We, we certainly would, would welcome the ability to uh, provide more grants to navigators out there in the community. Uh, we'd welcome the ability to uh, do more outreach ourselves uh, uh, to, you know, as you know, um, there has been a lot of misinformation about this law. People, uh, you know, really do need to understand the benefits of it and what it can do for them. Uh, and so uh, with the President's budget request, um, we, we certainly could use that money to do more outreach into the community and make people, make sure that people understand what the law is and how it can benefit them. 
You know, and I, I would just like to say to my colleagues, you talk about the fear in the, in, in the districts, and, and to the extent that there are some problems with the, the bill, if we could sit down and work together and figure out how to, how to make it better. But a lot of that fear is the misinformation that has been quite deliberately sent out. You watch Fox, it's hard not to be scared about Obamacare and what it, and what it, it might do to, to you. So I would suggest that the fear-mongering that is going on about this law, which has now been upheld by the United States Constitution, that will bring up to 30 million people of the United States of America to be able to have health care, that will help us join the community of nations in the world that, that declare that health care is a right of the citizens of their, their, their countries. Um, you know, we could use the help. All of us could use the help. All Americans could use the help to perfect this legislation. And I yield back. Thank you. The gentlelady yields back the balance of her time. Now recognize the gentleman from Colorado, Mr. Gardner, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Cohen, for your time with us this morning. And uh, my colleague said that there's fear mongering on this bill, but I would just like to point out that uh, I read an article the other day that the Roofers Union backtracks on Obamacare and wants repeal or reform of the bill. So I don't think this is uh, right wing fear mongering. I think when you have a union that's very concerned about Obamacare and wants its repeal or reform, I think that's where we have significant concerns that must be addressed. Mr. Cohen, are you familiar with uh, Richard Foster, the actuary of Medicare? I know who Richard Foster is, sure. Are you familiar with testimony that he gave before uh, the House of Representatives uh, Budget Committee a year ago or so? Uh, generally, but not specifically, no. In that testimony, he talked about the two central promises of the health care law that were unlikely to be fulfilled. Uh, one, that the bill will not hold costs down, and two, that uh, it won't let everybody keep the current insurance if they like it. Would you agree with that assessment? Well, I think, as I've said, uh, I, I do believe that costs will be down relative to where they would have been without the Affordable Care Act. So that's an increase, then? Uh, well, if medical costs increase, then the cost of insurance is going to increase. But uh, at so least So the, the at promise least people was made have, that it would keep costs down. Well, it will keep costs down relative to what they would have been without the law, and at least people will have the security. So what you're of, saying is least, that we will expect then costs increase. At least people will have the security of knowing that if they have a serious illness, their care will be paid for, uh, but which they, they don't have today. We are talking about cost increases. Well, for someone who has never been able to have health insurance before, to talk about an increase. What about the person who has health insurance? Are they going to experience cost increases? I, I think it's going to depend on the individual situation. Uh, there are factors that will cause costs to go down. Uh, there are tax credits that are available. Do, are, you uh, insured, are you insured through the federal system or do you have uh, outside insurance? I'm insured through the federal system. Has your insurance uh, gone down or gone up? You know, I don't even remember what happened. I think we had a small increase this year. But, so, a low, but, but we've had lower increases in the last two years uh, than we've had for a long time before that. I so mean, what, health, kind of what the we're fact that health insurance goes up is not new. I mean, that's health insurance. But I think the year, promise year, that was year. made in the health care bill, if, I, if I'm not mistaken, the promise was made that this would lower the cost of health care. Well, I think it will relative to where it would have been without the law. So this is kind of like the, the Washington two-step when we say we're cutting budgets, but you're actually decreasing the rate of an increase. Is that what you're saying Obamacare has done? I'm saying that I believe that health care insurance, and if you look at the total out-of-pocket costs that people have to absorb, uh, will be lower than it would have been without the law. Yes. So what, what, So that's an increase in costs, uh, because it if it's going may, to be... It may or may not be, depending if, on it's, What is an acceptable increase under? I mean, for, what are you anticipating under this health care bill? For, for, for women who've had to pay 50 percent more than men, uh, you know, the effect will be... Uh, to, to, to reduce their costs for people who have had to pay out of pocket for all their medical care. But reduce their costs even though their costs increase from year to year. It's just you're saying that uh, what you're saying is that, oh, it might not increase as much. I think it's going to depend on a number of factors, including the underlying cost of medical care. Well, let me ask you this then. Will Obamacare reduce the cost of health care? It will relative to what it would have been without the law, yes. But health care, but you're saying then that health care will increase. That will depend on factors that are external to the, the Affordable Care Act. It will depend on well, maybe the I'm not cost asking of health care. Maybe I'm not asking the question very clear. Yeah. Uh, will health care costs be less next year after the implementation of this bill? I think that will depend on yes, the Yes or no? I think that I, I can't answer the question. I don't know what's going to happen next year. 
So we don't know and whether I don't know what's going to happen to the underlying costs. cost of medical care. What about insurance? What doctors people, charge? What hospitals charge? What? What about insurance that people like? If they if they have their insurance and they want to keep it, uh, are they going to be able to? They they can if they're in a grandfathered plan and the plan doesn't change significantly, they can keep that coverage and it's not affected by the Affordable Care Act. So you're saying that if you like right, right now, uh, people across this country who have been told they're not going to be able to keep their insurance, they're they're being misinformed. They're misinformed if they don't understand that if they're in a plan that was grandfathered, as many people are, that they can keep that coverage, then yes, they are misinformed. So, so if the employer switches the plan because of this health care bill, then they get to keep their old health care? Employers can keep their employees in a grandfathered plan and not be affected by uh, the provisions of the Affordable Care Act. Which, yes. Do you know which plans were grandfathered? And I mean, if, if the, the health care bill requires them to change the plans, though, doesn't that mean that they're going to lose no, the health care? No, no, the health care law doesn't require them to change the plans. The, that's the whole point of being grandfathered. You don't have to change it if you're in a grandfathered plan. So these employers will never have to change their health care plan that they're offering? As long as the plan does not change significantly in terms of the benefits that they offer, if they keep the benefits... Or what's required same, by the health care bill. Expired. Then they can keep a grandfather plan and they do not have to comply with the provisions of the Affordable Care Act. That's what grandfathering means. Thank you. Gentleman's time is expired. Now we recognize the gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Long, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And Mr. Cohen, thank you for being here today. But I've got to say that if Rod Serling walked through that door right there, I wouldn't be surprised because he could walk in here and say, you have now entered the twilight zone. There cannot be so much difference in interpretation, I don't think, other than it's inexplainable. It is twilight zone-ish, if that's a word. We have uh, friends of mine on the other side of the aisle, a good friend that just spoke a minute ago, Mrs. Schakowsky. She, uh, to paraphrase her, said the Republican side of the aisle on the Republican side of the aisle, there is a relentless drumbeat of opposition to the president's health care plan. So I'm going to end my other very good friend over there, Gene Green, said something to the effect of people across America have seen vast improvements in their health care. And I think from the questions you've seen today, that's not what uh, some of us are hearing. So I want to start with a couple of yes or no answers, if I may, on some things some Democrats have said, see if you agree with them. Democrat Senator Max Baucus said, and I quote, I just see a huge train wreck coming down because of bumbling implementation. Yes or no, do you agree with that? I do not agree with that. Let's move to another Democrat senator. Let's move to Tom Harkin. Senator Tom Harkin and Mr. Cohen, yes or no, do you agree with Senator Harkin that this administration should not be raiding prevention fund rating the prevention fund for funding exchange expenditures? Uh, Congressman, I really am not going to express a view on that. That's not a decision that I made. It's not. You can't answer a yes or no I question whether you agree with a statement that. that a Democrat senator made? I, I can't. You I don't can't have, or you don't want to? You don't I, know if you agree with I don't have a view. You don't have a view whether you agree with a statement that a senator made? I don't. I really don't know what to say. I guess I'll wait for, wait for Rod Serling to come through the door, but... Uh, that would be the second coming of Rod Serling, I think. I think he passed away. The way things have been going here, I wouldn't doubt it. I mean, I could see it happening. This morning, according to Politico Pro's whiteboard, Senator Tom Harkin blasted HHA sec HHS Secretary Kathleen Sebelius at a hearing this morning it was after we had started this hearing, blasted Sebelius for using prevention fund money to pay for insurance navigators, saying the Obama administration is treating preventive care as an afterthought. To quote the senator, I'm sorry to say this administration just doesn't get it. And this is a Democrat. This is not the Republicans' drumbeat. First of all, it was a $5 billion raid last year on prevention funds, Harkin said, referring to the payroll tax extension President Barack Obama signed into law last year that cut $5 billion from the prevention fund. This year, it's another $332 million raid. It's sort of like the prevention fund is sort of an afterthought. 
I'm going to ask you one more time. Do you agree with Senator Harkin that this administration should not be raiding the prevention fund for funding exchange expenditures, yes or no? You know, I, I would have been happy if Congress had appropriated funding uh, for us to do the work that we need to do. Um, and, you know, that didn't happen. And so the Secretary made decisions under her authority. And I don't have an opinion one way or the other as to, uh, as to those decisions, no. Who would you direct me to? Let's say for a minute that uh, I have staff that come to me and say, we're a little confused. What's our health care going to cost starting 2014? What government agency would you direct me to to get that, their questions answered, what they're going to be paying for their health care next year? My staff. Well, if your staff is covered by the federal program, then I think the information that they would want to get would be from the program that administers their health care. What government agency? F FEHB or whoever, whatever, whatever coverage they have. OPM, That's, maybe? It could be. Well, we have tried relentlessly because I have, uh, well, you laugh at it, but no, no, my, I, my, staff, I, my staff's not laughing. And it's a very serious concern for me when you have staffers on this hill that have got college educations, some of them have law degrees, and they're living two and three people to an apartment because of the cost of living up here to get by, and they come to me with a legitimate question on what they're going to be paying next year. They're thinking about leaving government service. They're thinking about taking jobs other places. It's a very serious thing. So we have tried and tried uh, and tried to get the answer on what they're going to be paying. They OP, OPM cannot tell us. No, and, and I don't mean to minimize the Congressman. I, I was only smiling because I, I can't help with OPM, obviously. I, I wish I could, but I, I can't. Well, I gave Rod Serling five minutes, and he didn't make it, so I yield back. Gentleman's time has expired. And recognize the gentleman uh, from North Carolina, Ms. Elmer, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you, Mr. Cohen, for being with us today. Um, I, I do have to go back and just reiterate some of the points that have already been made and just get some clarification from you. Um, one, going back to um, the, the closing of, of the um, pre-existing uh, insurance coverage. Now, it's April. Uh, when, when was that closed? It was closed for the federal program in February and for the state programs in March. Okay. And so those individuals who would be utilizing those dollars for their pre-existing condition coverage will not be able to do so until January 1st. New enrollees, ex the existing enrollees are unaffected, but new, new people who would be coming into the program um, will not be able to come into the federal, to, to, into the PISA program um, un unless we are able to, yes, until January. Jan as it January, is right they now. Can as get, it is right now. As it is right now. Okay, right. I, you know, I, this, this is a confusing part about it because expe especially my, you know, colleagues across the aisle continuously try to paint us, us meaning Republicans here on the other side, as the ones who are interfering with anyone getting pre-existing coverage and, you know, looking at it from an unsympathetic standpoint. However, this program has been cut off and they support that. And here we are uh, attempting to pass legislation to actually help those individuals. I'm, I'm just... So are there we. Again. Will the I, woman, Leo? I, I, this is my time. You had your time. I, you know, I'm perplexed by that, and I, I, you clarified that for me. I just wanted to make sure that, that we clarify that we are talking about months of time that individuals will go without that, that care. Um, also, for clarification purposes, in the discussion that, that uh, the discussion you were having with Mr. Johnson and then, and then also with Mr. Gardner, um, you stated that as of... January 1st, 2014, that health care premiums will go down. Is this correct? No. What I think I said, what, I'm, what I believe is that, first of all, we don't know yet what premiums are going to be for coverage in January of 2014 because plans are just now uh, submitting those rates to their state insurance departments for approval to the exchanges of, with respect. Okay, but, but sir, so, that was not the promise. The promise that was made continuously when this was being implemented was that health care premium costs would go down. And, and so I am asking you under oath today, 
as you, as you see it, you are, you, so you are no longer standing behind that statement. You are now saying that, that it is un, that we are, we do not know and, and probably more than likely seeing health care insurance premiums going up. Is that correct? No, I, that's not correct. What I, I think I said was that for 2014, we need to wait to see how the rates come in. And over time, uh, I believe that the Affordable Care Act will result in a lower overall cost of uh, and what, okay, sir, what, what do you What do you base that on? Because CBO has done you know, a culmination of studies which showed, and, and I'll just cite North Carolina, that North Carolina health care premium rates will go up by 61%. So what are you basing your data? In? And if you do have studies that show this, I would like for you to submit them to the subcommittee. I, I'm basing it on um, the, um, the increased competition that will exist in the new marketplace compared to what we have today, where in many states... But that could exist with or without the Affordable Care Act going into effect. You know, we, we in Congress could enact many, um, you know, pieces of legislation and, and are working on, on just that to, to help increase competition well, amongst the health care Well, providers. it could, Congresswoman, but in most states today, in many states today, the individual and small group markets are dominated by one carrier that has 60, 70, 80, even 90 percent of the market. That's the reality and today. That could be easily and that's what remedied. we're going to change. That could be easily remedied with legislation. We don't need this massive takeover of health care, increasing rates by 61 uh, percent for, for, for those who I represent in North Carolina. Um, you know, there again, I, 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 would, I would really hope that you would be able to gather some data and again, under oath saying today, so you are basically saying I am incredibly unclear as to what will happen with health care rates as of, as of 2014. For, for, um, for most Americans, the millions of Americans who are covered by uh, insurance through their employer that's in a large group, they're, they're not going to see an effect from the Affordable Care Act one okay. way or another. Okay. Well, my so time is up, and it, it, I, I, I don't understand even what you base that on. Uh, if I could ask, General, you asked a question about, well, he was under oath, uh, if he, uh, since about a price is going up or not going up, and you didn't get a chance to answer that question, so I'm going to give you a moment to answer that question. With regard to, uh, you had, it was previously stated that the, the, about prices not going up. You said you couldn't guarantee that, and you were going to elaborate on that statement? I think we lost the thread. <laughs> All right. Mr. Chairman, let, let me ask. Mr. Cohen, did you ever say that Mr. You, Chairman, I, I think I'm next in the queue, it, it is. if I you don't mind, before I'd you go to a second round. Consent to Listen, the previous questioner advised the witness he was under oath and then asked him a question and refused to let him finish answering that question, and I think that is oh. inappropriate for this hearing. Well, I, I just asked so, you Mr. Like Chairman, I think that the witness should be allowed to complete his answer. I just did that, and uh, well, I'm not sure what the question was. Right. That's my problem. Uh, well, I, I will I mean, be I will be more than happy to re I mean, restate my question. If, if can that I ask will you help. could submit that it, question to the record? It is, and, it is wrong for members of this committee to try to put the witnesses in a perjury trap. That's when why they, when they come in here, no, ma'am, they are trying to help this. No, ma'am, I am clearly restating that that that, that the the. Um, uh, gentleman is under oath, and that he couldn't, he was not answering the question. Well, My uh, question please was. Please order here. What uh, I'd like to ask is if the gentlelady would submit that question, and we will ask Mr. I'd be Morris happy to answer the record. For the record. That way, we'll be sure what exactly you were asking, uh, Ms. Elmers, and ensure of your answer for the record. Thank you Thank so much. You. Recognize the gentlelady from Tennessee for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and sir, you've been patient with us, and we do appreciate it. I want to go to uh, your statement you made, <clears throat> I think, in response to Mr. Harper's question about over time you thought the insurance cost would come down. And um, this is something that I always watch very closely because I'm out of Tennessee. And you're probably familiar with the program 10 Care, and I know I've worn out all of my committee members here talking about 10 Care and asked Secretary Sebelius about it repeatedly. And uh, I just want to um, let you know that it seems from what we have found, what I have found in my research, and I've been working on this since we got 10 Care as a test case for Hillary Care in 1995, and bear in mind it quadrupled in cost over a five-year period of time. But sir, what we found is there is no example 
where these near-term expenses are going to yield a long-term savings in health care. And if you do have those examples, I would love to see them. Because through all of this debate of Obamacare, nobody has been able to show one. Not with public option care, not with guaranteed issue, not with community rating, not with any of this in New Jersey or Tennessee or Hawaii or anywhere else. Not with any of these CMS waiver programs. There is no example where you decrease cost, you increase access, and you get better outcomes. So if you can prove us wrong on that, then, you know, feel free to bring forward an example. Do you have an example? Congresswoman, I think for the, for the person today who doesn't have health insurance coverage and doesn't know how they're going to pay their medical bills uh, and worries about going into bankruptcy um, because their child is sick, I think for that person, a lot of this discussion is really irrelevant. And, we, and that's what we're going to change. Okay, let me ask you this. I want to ask you a question about the navigators. Is it true that the navigators cannot have health care or health insurance experience? No. That is not true. That's not true. Okay, because uh, that has been part of the understanding that is out there. Also, on your increased competition theory, I've got to tell you, what we've seen in Tennessee, uh, when you have government control, when it is government control, that's what runs people out of the marketplace. Well, this isn't government control. This is a commercial marketplace with private insurance with carriers Let me providing give you a coverage few to people. examples of what is happening in Tennessee. Uh, yesterday, of course, the rate filings in Maryland shows that small group coverage increases are going to go up 145 percent. And um, we've got examples in Tennessee that we have been polling our companies for this year and next year. This year they're going up anywhere from 26% to 132%. We're seeing 40 and 50% increases uh, expected for next year. In the young adult population, the survey we have here at Energy and Commerce Committee is looking at 145 to 185%. Families have already seen their insurance go up $3,000 per family since this law was passed. So what do I tell people that are coming to my town halls and saying, but the president promised my premium was going to go down $2,500 a year? What do we tell these people? Uh, I think you tell them that they should shop on the marketplace to find the plan that is best for their family and is the most affordable for them. And that's what we expect to be able to provide for people. But it's going to cost them more. I think if the health care costs have been going up year after year after year, long before we ever had Obamacare. So it has nothing to do, the fact the that the costs go up is isn't. The percentage is greater, and I think that you probably are aware of that. Do you believe that the increases are tied to the taxes and the mandates in Obamacare? Do you believe that that's any of the driver? The impact of the uh, taxes on uh, health care premiums is very small by all accounts. $165 billion is small? The impact on premiums of the taxes is you very small. You think that $165 billion of new taxes has a small impact on premiums. What do you call and, large? And we're, we're going to have... How would, we, you, how would you classify small and large? We have a, uh, a uh, reinsurance program that's going into effect um, that is estimated to reduce uh, premiums from what they otherwise would have been by 10 or 15%. Let me ask you a little bit about that. I, I, I would like to know if you find it odd or ironic that we are now subsidizing insurance purchase while at the same time we're making insurance more expensive by the mandates and taxes that are being piled on this. Thus, we're, we've got increasing subsidies and we're putting taxpayers on the hook for even higher federal spending. Do you find that odd or ironic? I think that Americans are paying for the cost of uncompensated care today. When people show up at the emergency room and they don't have coverage and they get treatment, uh, those costs have to be passed on to all uh, uh so you're comfortable and with so, the cost going so up. So we're going to we're going to uh, yield back. We're going to move to a system where we have uh, much more insurance coverage. We're going to spread the cost over more people, and that will be uh, to the benefit of all Americans. 
I thank the gentlelady from Tennessee. I might also add on that <clears throat> issue of uncompensated care. I hope that's an area you will ask. You'll submit more questions for the record, so we'll have those. I ask unanimous consent that the written opening statements of, the, of members be introduced into the record of those who wish that, and without objection, the documents will be entered in the record. And in conclusion, I'd like to thank all the witnesses and members that participated in today's hearing, uh, which would be you, Mr. Cohen. I remind uh, members they have 10 business days to submit those other questions for the record. And I ask that uh, Mr. Cohen um, re respond promptly to our questions. I appreciate you being here today. Well, I'm sure we'll be seeing you again soon. Thank you very much. Committee thank is adjourned. You.